Hi, Bob. Hi, Bob. How are you? I am not complaining about my life. Let me introduce us. As a policy, you're not complaining. No, actually, uh, <laughs> as today's policy, I, okay. I'm not, as is my my uh, public policy, I'm not complaining. Um, <laughs> so I'm Robert Wright. This is the Wright Show, available on both streaming video and via audio podcast. You are Bob Kagan or Robert Kagan, as you prefer. Very well known foreign policy thinker. You're what a fellow, the senior fellow at Brookings these days, or what? That's what are you? Correct. I just celebrated my 10 year anniversary. Really? Yeah. Did they throw you a party at Brookings? <laughs> they gave me a very, they gave me a nice little, I, I, some money. I think I like a hundred bucks or something. I can go, you know, a gift certificate at the uh, Brookings uh, uh, gift shop. It, I might be Best Buy or something. Yeah, probably the Brookings. Yeah, probably is Brookings. Yeah, Gift you, you yeah. Could, yeah. Um, so, uh, and you're an author of a number of books. What what book do you prefer to plug? I mean, uh, it doesn't really matter. It's called The Jungle Grows Back. Okay. The Jungle Being the World, which is a perfect segue, because we're going to talk okay. about the world. Or, or stuff... St- disorder returning to the world, I guess, Correct. would be, yes, which is something well, you're concerned about. Nature, human nature and the nature of international politics reasserting itself is what I would say, yes. Okay, the segues are getting better and better. So this is part of a series, one in a series of conversations I'm having with uh, noted foreign policy thinkers, such as yourself, um, who come from different parts of the ideological landscape and I'm talking to all of them about uh, how America should engage with the world, that is what its foreign policy should be, over, say, the next four years. Um, now, I generally start by asking people to give themselves an ideological label. In your case, that's a little complicated because uh, some time ago, you were widely known as a neoconservative, and I don't think you objected to the label, but you no longer call yourself that, even though some people still do, right? I mean, I always objected to the label for whatever the utility that objection is, since people are going to call you what they call you, regardless of what you want to be called. And and mostly because I just think that the term is so nebulous. Um, it also refers to... St- the original neoconservatives have nothing to do with foreign policy, right. um, as you well know. I don't consider myself a conservative in foreign policy. I think most views that I have would be associated with historically progressives mm-hmm. and liberals. Um, I'm not neo. I don't think it's, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? So there's a lot of, right. I've never really liked it. Obviously, it's also a kind of a, you know, people, it's kind of a dirty word. And, you know, people put it in there to make sure that. Was you know, it always? They, after the Iraq war, it got dirtier. Yeah, right. No, that's true. That's true. So, uh, so therefore, I, I don't, I don't know what it means. Now, I'm not big on any label. Um, and I think that, unfortunately, these labels are kind of the victory of uh, political scientists over historians. I uh, demand a label. I demand a label. Okay. So here's what I'm, here's what I'm going with today, and we can play around with it. I haven't discussed it before so this will be my opportunity to see whether i can defend it which is i'd like to currently refer to myself as a liberal realist a liberal realist okay yeah i and, heard that you're you trying to break that down if you'd like to i heard that you're calling yourself a realist and i must say i was surprised well i don't um, call myself a realist but people have like when i read certain things in the academy uh sometimes i get called a realist out there and i actually think that although I have all kinds of caveats about what realism is and also the way people are interpreting realism, it is definitely a closer approximation of what I think than neoconservative, for instance. Okay. So what what does realism mean to you in a foreign policy context? Well, you know, part of this is always, whenever you get into these kinds of discussions, these words mean they address two issues. One is how does the world work? Mm-hmm. And the other is what should you do? Um, those are two different things. And in the funny, in the case of realism, I think that the way realism is currently uh, 
articulated by people who call themselves realists uh, in a way is at odds with what realism is supposed to be doing as the way the world works. So, for instance, realism at its root, if you go back to like Hans Morgenthau, um, uh, is about the fact that countries are constantly seeking to maximize their power and everything else is secondary. Um, that is the explanatory, uh, you know, uh, theme of realism, and yet realists today are constantly uh, trying to argue against America maximizing and using its power. So this is a point that uh, Fareed Zakaria made a long time ago in a, in a book called From Wealth to Poverty, which is mm-hmm. after describing what realism is, which is all countries seeking to maximize their power, realists spend all their time trying to make sure America doesn't maximize its power. So, mm-hmm. um, there, so there was a, it's very contradictory, but for me, um, realism means it, it really it does mean the centrality of power and the exercise of power in human affairs and the failing of realists in my view is that they it's only about the failure of the real sort of original realism is that it's only about power and they slight ideas uh, ideas are just a cover for the use of power um, whereas various kinds of liberal ideas idealists folk think that ideas are what matters and power doesn't, you know, ideas are more important than power. And my view is that history is shaped by the intersection of power uh, and ideas and beliefs. And you really can't understand what's going on uh, if you're not looking intently at both of those. And by ideas, do you kind of mean ideals? Yeah, I mean, it, well, I mean, it's a hard way, you know, what is... What is Protestantism? Is it an idea or an ideal? Mm-hmm. Um, and liberalism, uh, if you say it's an idea, it, is that is liberalism an idea or an ideal? Well, it, it's it, it entails, right. it's, it, it's an idea that entails ideals. Right. I mean, it, 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 right. It's, it's, so there's a religious, there's a kind of faith aspect to mm-hmm. all ideals, right? And um, ideas are, again, can be about how does the world work and how do you, mm-hmm. and liberalism is both, right? Liberalism has a view of what the good is, but it also, since the enlightened, you know, it has these enlightenment ideas that are descriptive of the way humanity operates, right? So it's, it's both of those things. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I think you're right that uh, ideologies often have both a descriptive and a prescriptive element. I think realism, more than most, has an explicitly fleshed out descriptive uh, account of the world. Right. Right? You wouldn't necessarily think of liberal internationalists, say, or even maybe neoconservatives, having an, an agreed upon kind of descript- diagnosis, kind of, um, or, or just description of the way the world works. And... and and when I when I said I was surprised to hear you, that you're calling yourself a realist, I mean mainly on the prescriptive side. I can see that you might agree with a lot of realists that the world is in, it's it's in some sense a jungle out there. To get back to your the title of your book, nations are they pursue their self interest. They may do it ruthlessly. Any foreign policy has to adapt to that fact. Um, I would I would add as an asterisk, and, and I say this as someone who calls myself a progressive realist, which might seem to be a close cousin of a liberal realist like you. I'm not sure either of us would consider ourselves close cousins when it comes to the prescriptive side. But I would say that in my own case, it's not that I am saying that that when you get to my prescriptions, I would be saying the U.S. should not try to maximize its power. It's that um, I would say that uh, some of the ways we've been trying to maximize our power, uh, particularly through military intervention, have in fact wound up eroding our power and predictably may do so. And some of the things I might prescribe that might sound idealistic, like compliance with international law and the nurturing of international law and the norm of complying with international law, I think in the long run would maximize certainly American well-being and in in a certain sense, power, in the sense of its control over its own destiny. But that, all that aside, um, we'll go ahead and it looks like you well, want to I, By the way, I don't think America's job should be maximizing its own power either. I mean, that's I, I, I was saying that's what realism 
says nations do. Um, but I and I and I don't and obviously you can you may not be maximizing your power by using your power as you as you say about Iraq. So no, that's not that's not my uh, goal. And look, when you get to talking about the, the problem, when you talk about um, you know actual policies and what's actually going on in the world, is that um, at that point, I think doctrine doesn't do you a lot of good. It's more because every situation is, is unique and every geopolitical situation is unique. And this is my other, you know, problem with the realists, which is I don't think they sufficiently take account of the uniqueness of the American led order that they, they are trying to constantly put it back into what I think they sort of prefer, which is the sort of model of, you know, the Congress of Vienna, European multipolarity, they're constantly recurring to multipolarity as if that is sort of uh, the norm and therefore they can't deal with sort of this unusual situation that we're in and that the the United States created after World War II. Um, But that is also a historically, you know, these things are all contingent and historically grounded. And the sort of the attempt to move from that to general theory is, I think, where things break down. So, so you think they're uncomfortable with a world of you, you, you called it, it talked about a kind of a rules based order. But you think they're uncomfortable with American hegemony as well? They're uncomfortable with it theoretically as well as, you know, as well as morally. But but my, from my point of view, their problem is, is that they're uncomfortable with it theoretically. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if you read Henry Kissinger over the any time since the 1960s, he's constantly anticipating the imminent return of multipolarity, um, that there is no way to sustain this kind of... Uh, structure of power in the world. And Mm -hmm. it's only a matter of time before the United States declines to the level where you've created multipolarity again. And my argument on that score is that the United States really does represent something quite unique in the world and, and setting aside for the moment, the ideological aspect, but just from a purely geopolitical, geographical, economic, a whole host of, factors put the United States in a unique position to be able to do what it has done since uh, World War II, which is basically to be able to provide security and an order in both Europe and Asia that didn't exist before and couldn't exist without the United States. You'd have something else. You'd have a different order. Um, And I think that's the part of this that I don't think people have sufficiently grappled with. Um, that that this is an unusual situation, but it may be unusual and durable. Okay. Um, it may be durable. Uh, on the other hand, America's relative weight in the world, measured by economics, uh, has declined in part due to the success of the American model and the export of the American model and the, expropri- the appropriation of the model of parts of the model, even by countries like China, which are in other respects very different from America. So I, but I think you that's... Specified, but you specified that the relative superiority of America in economics, that's true. But right. there's, no compara- there's no comparing the geostrategic position of the United States and its alliance relationships with any other power. At the moment... That, that, I think, is the source, ultimately, yeah. of of American power in the system and also what makes the system durable. Yeah. Yeah. Although I think the, uh, what, what held together the, the kind of American led alliance, uh, after world war two is not as evident, um, since the end of the cold war as it was at one point. In fact, most of our interventions were many of our interventions in the world have not been kind of along that, you know, the cold war, uh, the classic Cold War boundary. And I'm not talking about the Cold War. I don't think no. the Cold War is the... Uh, that's another thing that I may differ with a lot of people on. I think we've overemphasized the significance of the Cold War and underestimated the significance of the international system that the United States created, really began to create during World War II and really had set in place even before... American policymakers thought they were going to be in a Cold War. And so I think that that has, in fact, endured, um, that that is the great 
sort of historical difference in the world, not the Cold War. <laughs> and how would you how would you characterize that system? You're talking about what is called the rules based order, the liberal no. order. What do you, you talk? What, you do you, what is the system that you're in favor of and you think can endure? What 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 are its elements? Well. <clears throat> The, the core thing that happens after World War II is that, first of all, Germany and Japan go from being uh, basically rising, powerful, aggressive dictatorships seeking to, you know, gain hegemony in their respective regions to becoming essentially non-geopolitical actors uh, content to live for the most part under the American security umbrella and also democracies and therefore, and related to this, also engines of economic progress in both those regions. I would say that was the key building block, which has persisted until, you know, through, uh, through to today. But you can also add... The, the previous world powers, including great empires of the 19th and early 20th centuries, have basically ceased playing that role, France uh, and Britain. And so if you take all those powers, which were the, the story of international relations for, you know, for two centuries, uh, at least before and then when Germany and Japan joined, and you basically have taken, they've all left the equation of geopolitics. I could, I mean, and, and which has had all kinds of knock-on effects. One is the economic that I described. The other is also the spread of democracy in their regions. And I think they're, the security issue and the growth of democracy are related because it's hard to have a democracy when you're threatened militarily. It's easier to have a democracy when you're relatively secure. So that is the sort of, and all of that is underpinned by the ability of the United States to provide this security uh, in a way that nobody else can. So that that's to me the unique element of this situation, which, you know, I would have I was worried and I still am worried that Trump can that President Trump can find a way to destroy all this. But I'm sort of surprised, maybe a little bit, maybe I shouldn't be by the by the way that these aligned systems are enduring despite Trump's best efforts to undermine them. So is the thing that you want to preserve going forward that you fear not everyone would want to preserve a kind of loose alliance of democracies? Well, I, I would be content to pre preserve what we what we have had, which is uh, it's not such a loose alliance. It's a pretty tight alliance. I mean, after all, it's not a loose alliance to say that we will go to war if somebody goes to war with Japan or that we'll go to war if somebody goes to war with Lithuania. That's a pretty tight alliance from a historical point of view. It's more than the British ever guaranteed to the French, for instance. So, um, no, that is the thing that I most worry about um, okay. us losing. Do you want democracies to remain united? I want to maintain, yes, but uh, definitely that. But I also want to maintain this security structure, which has the United States at the heart of it, not because I think America has, uh, you know, some kind of God-given mission, but because it's the only power capable of, of doing it. And the consequence of it have been very great benefits to a very large percentage of humanity, including indirectly the Chinese, as it happens, and as you were pointing out. Okay, so how how does this play out on the ground in in terms of say the relationship with China? Because yeah. some people who lately have been emphasizing the importance of sticking with democracies have been uh putting that in the context of having a more and more kind of skeptical and distant relationship with China. Like Josh Hawley wrote this op-ed for the Times uh, maybe maybe four or five months ago, and I don't know if he used the term decoupling, but he's kind of he's kind of in the decoupling crowd, uh, and and certainly this is this is one big issue. You you can imagine someone who is advocating something like what it sounds like you're advocating, who still would like robust engagement with China. Uh, maybe another way to ask the question is to what extent should economic relations and the warmth of diplomatic relations depend on whether another nation is a liberal democracy? 
Well, uh, let me let's accept that a question. Let me get answer that question second because that's an interesting and complicated question. But in the first instance, my basic feeling about China is that so long as China doesn't seek to use its military power to exert hegemony in its region, and by its region means Japan and Korea and uh, obviously Southeast Asia, etc. I am content to let China succeed economically. In fact, I would argue that in a way the best bargain that the United States has made with the rest of its order is is to allow everyone to thrive economically in exchange for which they basically forego historic geopolitical ambition. Now, and they can win economically. You know, we used to worry that Japan had won the Cold War because of their economic strength or that Germany was outperforming us, which has made, you know, people who support Trump very nervous. But from my point of view, that's all to the good. Let's have Mm -hmm. a nice global economic competition so that we don't have a security competition. So I, I actually think in the grand scheme of things, although there are some complicated issues here which we can get into, but, but, but writ large, I think it's a mistake for us to squeeze China economically, um, which I think can only drive them toward military answers to their problems. Whereas what I would like to do is be strong enough and committed enough to deter them militarily while allowing them to flourish economically as much as possible. Um, so now on your second question. Well, let me just uh, inter- don't forget yeah. the second question, but let me say that um, that that does sound kind of realist to me. I, I think of realists as putting more emphasis on the external behavior of other nations in terms of like what kind of demands we place on them and, and how we react to them than on what's going on internally. So realists generally aren't big on, say, intervening, uh, well, militarily or, or even, in a sense, economically, say, with sanctions because of human rights issues in, inside other countries. Now, I think we all have some threshold for doing something, right? I mean, a thoroughgoing, you know, so, uh, genocide in the classic sense or something. I think we would all say at some point you have to, to do something. But um, that aside, do you agree that this is a kind of, as I understand it, it's kind of a realist aspect of you that 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 your main concern with China, so far as uh, how our relations with China are are going to be um, in reaction, uh, your main concern is with China's external behavior. From a foreign policy point of view, I think that has to be our main concern, and. Okay. Um, I think that it is in our interest to avoid war with China um, as long as by avoiding war we're not allowing China essentially to get what it wants without war, but by nevertheless using military intimidation, which it's trying to do in the South China Sea and Taiwan. And do you mean the actual acquisition of territory? Right, or the or the ascent effective expulsion of the United States from relations with allies because the allies have decided it's too dangerous given Chinese power. That's another that's another element of it. Now, at the same time, look, uh, I do think that the ideological fact of China is very important, and it a in the first place it means we will never have a true meeting of the minds as far as uh, as far as our relations are concerned. They will always regard us as a threat, even if we choose not to regard them as a threat. It's just a fact of life that authoritarian or autocratic or totalitarian or whatever term you want to use, uh, leaderships are inherently threatened by the very dominant democratic system. And there are people, there will always be people in China seeking to push uh, for greater rights. And so, and I think the Chinese biggest fear is of internal subversion backed by external power. And so therefore, they're always going to regard us to some extent as a hostile entity, even if just, we're... Just by virtue of existing as a democracy? Because I, I've always yeah, thought China no, was no. actually pretty pragmatic and almost amoral in their in their foreign policy in a certain sense if you if you look around at 
countries they do business with, it's like they, it seems to me they just want to do business. Um, okay, well, this is where, this is where I, this, okay, good. I mean, this is where we can have a disagreement because, you know, and this is where I think <laughs> liberal realism comes into play. Um, I think the fact what we see of China today is a China that exists in an American dominated dem- democracy dominated world. And you talk about pragmatism. Yes, they are pragmatically responding to a situation of power um, and not just military power, but economic power and alliance structures the Chinese are obsessed with the fact that they basically have no allies and we have like 54 allies or friendships, et cetera, et cetera. So the China we see today is the China that is heavily constrained. We don't know what a less constrained China would be like, but it's a mistake to assume that it's the same. It would be the same. And that goes particularly, that goes also on the question of, ideology. And there is this assumption that uh, China is not interested in spreading its ideology. But if you go back, what we've been living in since World War II is a world where the authoritarians have basically been on their back heel the whole time. You know, we don't, haven't lived in a world where autocracies are actually as powerful or more powerful. We've seen what a world like that looks like. We saw what the first half of the 20th century looked like. We saw what, for instance, the great power autocracies of the early 19th century did. They were in the business of stamping out liberalism around their borders, Russia in Poland, Austria in Italy uh, and Germany and what was, you know, then uh, not yet Germany. And so I think the mistake comes in believing that were China to get a significant position of power and feeling of security, would it not then begin to do this? And, you know, something that I, I, I wrote this essay about the return of the strong men in the Washington Post a couple of years ago. And I'm sorry, I've got fruit flies attacking me here. Um, don't ask, it's, they're not because of any fruit that I've left around. But um, we can already see to some extent a kind of bolder Chinese assertion of, and also from Vladimir Putin, a kind of assertion of their of the rightness of their anti-liberal position. And here's where, uh, and this is where I want to get into my, the caveat to my let them live and be well approach, which is that one of the things the Chinese are creating and exporting is the technology of repression. And this is because of their mastery of, um, uh, of, uh, you know, social networking and AI, et cetera. And they are based, you know, they are selling their products to Egypt and others. And so in that sense, they are exporting the capacity for, uh, for greater repression. I, and I don't know where that is going, uh, but I would worry if we saw a continuing acceleration of that. Okay. Um, let me, uh, I mean, there's so many, strands you could pick up on uh, let me just say one one thing and, and just kind of bracket it i don't think we want to get off on this argument but i do think there are people who would say and i think i may be one of them that it uh it's important to try to distinguish between uh russian or chinese responses to uh just our existence as a liberal democracy distinguishing that and distinguishing between what they perceive as unwanted meddling either in their internal affairs or on their periphery right and and i think from their po- uh, point of view now so china seems to have a pretty sensitive trigger in this regard i i i, I concede by our standards when when a general manager of an nba team says something that you know about hong kong that sends it into a frenzy i mean that that's that's uh, a degree of sensitivity we're not accustomed to seeing at the same time that from their point of view that's different from just our existence and i'm not advocating that we Um, silence gms of nba teams right russia is maybe a clearer example where i think you know the expansion of nato their perception of what happened in ukraine uh the 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 georgia stuff and, and on and on i think there it's pretty it's pretty easy to argue 
that uh, a certain amount of current Russian hostility toward us has to do with their perception, which you can argue with if you want, but that we were messing in their affairs or we were messing in their neighborhood in a way that we would not tolerate in the case of our neighborhood. Right. And let me just let me be very clear. I'm not saying that it's our existence that is a threat to them, although to some extent our existence has been a threat since the beginning. I mean, if you look at what Metternich has to say about the United States in the 1820s, it's that he regards it as a threat because it's an example of being overthrown. But it's not Mm -hmm. so much that we're coming over there or anything. But there is a problem when you have liberal democracy in the midst of authoritarian governments. They feel threatened by it. But that's not what I'm talking about so much in the case of Russia and China today. I'm talking about the fact that this structure of democratic alliances is a threat to them, and precisely for the reason that you were just identifying, which is that structure of democratic alliances is deep in their neighborhood. Now, the that one of the attributes of this of this system and order that was created after World War II within the order itself was only one country has gets to have a sphere of influence and that was the United States. Right. I mean, whenever we talk about how come we're in Russia's sphere of influence and China's sphere of influence and people start saying you really should let everybody have their sphere of influence I'm, I'm always, I always wonder what they, does, why are they the only two powers? Why would it only be three powers having spheres of influence? Germany once had a sphere of influence. Britain had a sphere of influence. France had a sphere of influence. Mm-hmm. Japan had a sphere of influence, which included mainland China. Powerful so, countries have spheres of influence. Well, except in this order that we have created. And it is not you the You mean case. because only we get to have one? Because Japan and Germany and others are perfectly content um, to have an overall security umbrella provided by the United States in cooperation with them and are not demanding traditional spheres of influence because they don't feel threatened by the absence of a sphere of influence. Okay, but surely you could... So then the question is, what makes Russia and China different um, I think there was a moment when when Russians flirted with the idea of making that same essential bargain. I would say in the Yeltsin years, there were certainly Russian officials, uh, including the foreign minister, um, who were basically willing to say, yes, let's just become part of the West in the same way that Germany and Poland are part of the West. Now, I think for all kinds of understandable historical reasons, I think Russians as a whole rejected that. Putin certainly and explicitly rejects that. Um, but it, it's not inconceivable. Um, and I also think it wasn't inconceivable that China could have accepted such a role if it hadn't been for Mao and the revolution. I mean, after all, uh, it wasn't inconceivable for, like, if you would ask the Chinese in the 1920s or 30s, many of them would have said, if you can rid us of Japanese aggression uh, by becoming the sort of provider of security in the region and just allow us to make money and try to improve our society, that's a pretty good deal um, that they might well have accepted, as many other countries did accept it, including uh, countries in Europe and Asia. Okay, when you talk about the deal that Russia or China might have accepted, are you talking about subordinate status to the United States? That would be part of the deal. We are the hegemon? It, it would be. It's subordinate in terms of security. That's right. I well, mean, does, it, does it shock you that a nation the- like China, which has like no. five times our population, is growing economically by leaps and bounds and may well someday have way more economic clout than we have, and therefore, if it chooses more military clout might be saying to itself, no, we don't imagine being eternally subordinate to the United States. We imagine being a great power and asking for the things great powers ask for, including a sphere of influence. I I agree with that. Of course, that's exactly what they're doing. And I mean, I would say that China does, you know, if you look at the great sweep of Chinese history before the 20th century, the the idea that they should be subordinate to anybody in their region is, is inconceivable since their image of what themselves in the region is that they're the hegemon of their region. Now, on the other hand, just because they feel that way, in theory, every country can and 
does feel that way. And we can go back to a world where everybody gets to fight for their sphere of influence. And that's the world that we looked at in the, tw- in the beginning of the 20th century. And if you're asking me, is what I'm proposing a just order? I don't believe there is such a thing as a just order. Um, I prefer it. I think it's a better order. Um, but is it just to Chinese traditional aspirations to be the hegemon of Asia? No, it's not. Just but it's not. The- it's also not realistic. That's the thing. It seems to me a realist must, above all, accommodate themselves I'm to realism, I'm to the reality of the world. I'm not <laughs> suggesting that the Chinese are going to accept that, and certainly not now. All I'm saying, I guarantee to you, you is- they won't. Uh, congratulations, and I completely agree with you. I'm not, <laughs> well, then I'm why not, should? Well, then demanding it would seem to be a fool's errand. I, you're 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 mis- you're misunderstanding okay. what I'm saying. I'm not demanding it. I'm I'm just saying that it 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 is in fact, you know, it is the bargain that the United States struck with much of the world, including great powers, which previously would have been just as uh, unwilling to accept this as they have and 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 they feel like they've benefited from it and interestingly enough don't want to change it in fact they're mm-hmm. worried about having to change it you know but that's fine i i'm realistic about what china mm-hmm. is i'm realistic about what china wants i already told you what my strategy was it's not to force them into subordination but it is a kind of subordination to say as i think we're all saying including you bob that they don't get to have the hegemony that they think is historically appropriate to their position. You don't want them, I think, to be the hegemon of Japan, Korea, Southeast Asia, uh, and and everything else that used to be the historic position of China. Well, I want them to abide by international law. I mean, this is very important to me, and and I want minute, us to abide minute. by Can international they're... law. And well, no, let me just finish. Let is me that just finish. Realistic. <laughs> So far, so far, it hasn't been. Uh, you know, there are all kinds of things that once were not realistic. The end of slavery was once not realistic. There are all kinds of things as humankind progresses that were once not realistic, and then suddenly they're part of of reality. And including, by the way, uh, political organization on the scale of uh, of of Europe or. You know, at one point, there had been no empires. At one point, there had been no nation states. Uh, and, and even now, nation states do much more in the way of referring to international law in, in relating to each other than they used to do. Things change. He, all Beginning I'm saying, when? all I'm Beginning saying, when? what's that? When did they begin to do this? Well, they pay lips or, uh, you mean international law? It's been a slow evolution. A slow evolution since when? I don't know. What's the name of that guy? Gradius, whoever the hell. I mean, I, I can't, Grotius? I can't, I can't, I don't have my Encyclopedia Britannica. No, but see, okay, okay the reason I'm, the reason I'm, uh, uh, saying this to you is this is the other thing that I, that I think liberal realism is, and it's different from your progressive realism or whatever that is, which is, I am not persuaded that the world, uh, human nature, and the nature of the international system is progressing, educating itself, learning to behave better. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't believe there is a steady accumulation of respect for international law since Grotius. Uh, If you look at the way the world behaved, the way great powers behaved up through uh, the Second World War, you would not see tremendous fidelity uh, to any of those kinds of things. And what I think the one of our intellectual problems now is that it is, in fact, this system that we created in which those, those kinds of progress have been taking place. But those same, that same progress, in my view, is very fragile. And were this order to uh, collapse or return to a world of spheres of influence like the, every century before uh, the World War II, that all this progress that you're talking about uh, might disappear. And that includes, you know, all the things that you would say, torture and man's inhumanity to man in various different ways. And I think as we look around the world today, I think, this is a time when we ought to be more in doubt 
than at any time in our lifetimes about whether there really is progress in that way. Okay, but, but my view is not necessarily even an optimistic one. I, I, it, my belief is just that, A, if you are a, a power that, who, if you are a, you know, a hegemon whose power is probably going to decline in relative terms and has been for some time, it might be wise for you to help build a world in which hegemony is not everything. Because you just may not always be the hegemon. It may make sense to construct a set of rules that everyone is expected to abide by and actually abide by them. We, we did start building such a, a set, especially after World War II. I wouldn't say we've been great at abiding by them, but leaving that aside, that's A. B, let, let me just say one more thing. My own view is that uh, there are a series of international policy challenges uh, that go well beyond climate change. And well beyond nuclear arms control into the realm of bioweapons and even the regulation of like genetic engineering in realms that aren't weaponry uh, and weapons in space and cyber weapons. There are a lot of realms in which if we do not uh, succeed in forging international policies that are respected, my belief is that we'll all be in deep trouble. Now, that, that could be just wrong. But I want to emphasize, it doesn't depend on, my, my view has nothing to do with optimism. In fact, it's almost the opposite. It's that if we don't make a, uh, a major um, leap forward, not, not in the Chinese sense of great, great leap forward, um, that, uh, that tremendous trouble could ensue. So in, in my mind, there's a lot of logic, ultimately self-interested logic, American self-interested logic, but but it's also in the interest of other nations to uh, build a system of international law along with uh, cultivating the norm of complying with the law. I don't think we've done a good job of that, but but that's the logic of my position. Okay. I understand that. But, you know, just because we need to do something, I mean, we, the human race, doesn't mean that it's going to happen. And, you know, no, but it, it seems like a good reason to advocate it rather than the alternative. Well, you can advocate it, but then, you know, just don't uh, don't don't accuse other people of being unrealistic because uh, I think it's unrealistic. And I don't think it would I don't think international law without the undergirding of a power structure uh, has any real chance of success. And I've heard this argument, John, I can, you're, you're basically quoting John Eikenberry about why it's in America's interest to get ready for the time when America is no longer this powerful. My feeling is when America is no longer this powerful, we're going to have a different world order and it's not going to be one based on international law. But um, so, so, you know, I just think the fact that we, they desperate, the world desperately needed the Kellogg Briand pack to work, uh, but it didn't, you know, and so, and, but they did all come together and create a new international law outlawing war. And yet, and it um, was flawed. And so maybe we should try even better flawed. next time. Why was it, why was it flawed? Well, was there an enforcement mechanism? Oh, an enforcement mechanism. Mm -hmm. So you, that's my point. So then it, you can only have an enforcement mechanism if the countries that want to enforce it are powerful enough to enforce it, which means, which suggests a certain degree of agenda. No, there, there's such thing as non hegemonic enforcement. I really? mean, yeah, yeah. Like, really? uh, Where yeah. would that be? Countries that violate the Chemical Weapons Convention in principle are subject to sanctions in, by all of them. In or, principle. Or, or, no, actually, there have been some, uh, textbook, um, some, some cases of actual compliance with, uh, the, the UN Charter in the way of, uh, enforcing the, the ban on trans border aggression. So, the Persian Gulf War, the Bosnian intervention, both of those consisted of somebody going to the UN Security Council and saying, I want this to have the mandate of the United Nations. That's what makes it legal. And now we do it and it's legal. These things actually happen. Now, we also, the U.S. also violated international law in invading Iraq, Co the Kosovo intervention, the second half of the Libyan operation. So we're not doing a very good job Vietnam, of nurturing this. But Vietnam, any number of uh, overthrown governments. I mean, we violated. Yeah, and how did that, and how did those things go? And how did consistently, consistently since and how did, the moment and how that the charter was established? And how okay? has that worked out? You're citing all, all the famous disasters that, you that know wound up hurting us. Well, 
you could point to those disasters, but believe it or not, there were worse disasters than than what than than what we've been able to avoid also over these past uh, seventy five years. There is there are, for instance, the disasters of the first uh, forty one years of uh, uh, of the twentieth century, and I think that. I mean, part of the problem of focusing on all the things that haven't gone right assumes that, first of all, there is a way of conducting foreign policy where nothing doesn't go right. Um, but on, in addition to which, it completely ignores uh, much larger benefits that have accrued. And, and for you to talk about the Persian Gulf being an exercise of international law, yes, George Bush got a UN Security Council resolution, by the way, only because... For a brief moment, the Soviets were not in the business of opposing almost anything that the United States, which is o- which a period which is over, by the way. Thanks but, in but, part to but, our but, own behavior, but go but ahead. In the end, no, I don't think that's true. Well, we disagree. I think it, it, it's the way great powers treat international law. They 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 use it when they like it, and they ignore it when they don't. That's the kind of that's that's I think realism. Um, well, that's and, and, if that's what has happened historically. That's what I'm saying yeah, needs to change. That's the way human beings behave. Yes, if that's what you mean. Yes, and and so what well, we're arguing, you know, what are you suggesting that human beings at some point will stop behaving that way? Look, the U.S. frontier justice used to be all over the U.S. There used to be mass lynchings in the South, and and, and the police didn't do anything about them. That time is over because. Uh, law, which w- had not spread comprehensively across the United, Na- United States, did. It can happen. Things can change. Oh, it can happen within a nation where, and by the way, that is the ultimate situation of hegemony, Bob. The, the, the federal government has a complete monopoly of power in that situation to back up law with. The problem, as all the realists would be quick to point out to you, and anyone else who wants to know, is that in the international system, you don't have anyone exercising that kind of hegemony or monopoly of power. But in any case, the fact that the Persian Gulf War did what it did was only due to the fact that the United States had the capacity to do it. It wouldn't have happened simply because the UN Security Council passed a resolution. The League of Nations also passed numerous resolutions in the 1920s and 30s. Well, so, that had that had no teeth, but the, the, the no structure teeth. of the U.N. obviously favors the powerful. So does the structure of American uh, law in practice for better or worse. But that doesn't mean there's there's nothing that you can call the rule of law in America just because powerful people have a better chance of getting off with getting I away with crimes I than others. I the, the, um, let, let me and by the way, one realist who I think would disagree with you, is actually Hans Morgen- Morgenthau. The, uh, in, in his book, Politics Among Nations, he says, in principle, a realist could believe in world government if the technological environment, I think I'm, I'm uh, the second, uh, this part of what I'm saying uh, accurately reflects what he says, uh, uh, in particular, if technological changes, you know, change the structure of the world sufficiently. I'm arguing they have, but in any event, Hans Morgenthau himself does not agree with you that the very notion of uh, uh, of robust international law is antithetical to realism. That's because Hans Morgenthau couldn't face the implications of his own theory. And okay. I don't know why that's true. I think it has something to do with the life he led in the world he lived in, etc. But I think anyone who is, and you know, you can have tremendous respect for Hans Morgenthau without denying that that is an, a glaring contradiction. Uh, it's and that not. He, it's throwing that, uh, it, 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 it is. Um, you can't spend all your time talking about how nations don't uh, uh, abide by ideals or international law or anything else and then say, but in principle, we could have a world like that. But it's OK. We don't have to argue with Hans Morgenthau. He's not here to defend himself. So I'm and I don't know his work well enough to do it for him. But the um, l- let's just quickly to get back to the question of whether um, I mean, so you're not calling yourself a. a a Let's get back to what I'm calling myself the really important well, thing. <laughs> well, no, no, the concrete, the concrete implications of that. So yeah. the 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 things, the positions of yours that I would associate with neoconservatism um, are include um, at you, you uh, advocacy of the Iraq War, 
Um, I assume you supported the Kosovo intervention. Um, you probably supported the Bosnian intervention, as did I. I, I of course, I was happy to see uh, them go through proper international legal channels in in, in doing it. But um, uh, the Libyan intervention, um, I, I would assume that whatever your ideal policy would have been in Syria, you 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 supported the the U.S. and its allies providing arms to the rebels. Am I uh, am I right in characterizing these past positions? My next question will be: Have you rethought? Have you rethought any of that? Is there stuff that you would you would uh, do differently? Well, I, I I could get to that, but I'm sure it's great to run the tape backwards in history rather than forwards uh, after you already know what what's happened, but. I guess when I, when you say there were so many different kinds of people, uh, for instance, who supported, uh, the, uh, the war in Kosovo, were they all neoconservatives? No, no. I mean, Clinton. So why, uh, why is, why is that an example of being a neoconservative? No, I didn't say that anyone who supported the intervention in Kosovo uh, was a neoconservative. I'm saying that if you ask me what would I predict a neoconservative would say about each of those issues, it would be the positions I just listed. That's all. Right, but I'm I just mean, if I'm wrong, I... first of all, am I wrong? Are, are you... And by the way, a lot of liberal interventionists uh, would agree uh, with you on most or all of those. I agree right. on one, um, but uh, but but well, I'm so seriously, I'm, just... I'm seriously just just trying to position. You. But well, here's another way to put it. Well, no, I know realists... you're trying to position me, but I'm what I'm trying to do is raise doubts about what any of this means. I just look. Okay, I don't but know realists opposed most uh, much of that stuff. Mo- most realists including... oppose most of that stuff. So the question oh, is why oppose, they opposed all of it. So why are you calling yourself a realist? It's not what the term oh, means in actual language. I, I thought we got past this in the first three well, minutes no, of our this conversation. Is... I already said my problem with people who call themselves realists is I don't know how realistic they are. And I think, in fact, they're actually moralists. I think that most mo- people who today call themselves realists are, in fact, moralists in a very classic American way. In, in what they way? don't want the United States to abuse its power. That's their number one. By the way, I don't want the United States to abuse their, its power either, but their greatest concern is the is America abusing its power. I think that makes that puts them in a tradition of a certain kind of peace progressive in the 1920s and 30s. It puts them in the position of a certain kind of anti-imperialist in the 18, you know, in 1899. But, but I think the difference is they are consequentialists. They are concerned about the blowback. They that say that, but then, you know, why did they oppose the Persian Gulf War? Um. The, uh, well, as it happens, the, the the ultimate consequences of that ultimately didn't work out well. <laughs> well, but, the ultimate the, the, consequences the, the, of everything don't. I mean, work I don't out, look. You, I, mean, you, I don't you know. Say, I'm, you can say I'm sure they have an answer. Because it led to the uh, occupation of half of Europe by Soviet communism. I mean, if if you're if 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 they can point at some point down the road to things not working out as proof that they were right, then I, I think that's also an unrealistic well, well, vision I, of the world. I mean, I don't know what they say about that. I would say. As a rule, they couch their objections in consequentialist terms. They worry about the blowback. I'm just saying that that distinguishes them from a the kinds of moralists that I think you're alluding to. Who I'm not sure. I mean, it's interesting if you go. I've been for my sins. I've been spending a tremendous amount of time reading foreign policy thinkers and commentators in the 1930s. You know, mm-hmm. and. And the people who I think were, who sort of would be quali- would be characterized as realists in that period, um, definitely thought that the United States should not get involved in any of the conflicts around the world. And their argument was that Americans were not threatened by what happened in Europe, even if Hitler took power, and they were not threatened by what happened in Asia, even if Japan gained complete hegemony in China and their major concern was really that the United States not get involved out there. I think, you know, if you read the, the, the best realist, the smartest realist, the best book written about realism is Robert Osgood's ideals and self-interest. And, you know, if you look at what Osgood says about that 
period, he, he, make, he makes a very critical point, which is that realism that is not guided by idealism is likely to make mistakes, by which he meant the realists underestimated the, the, the threat posed by someone like Hitler and, some, and a regime like the Japanese regime. You know, but their but their default position is don't do it. And I think that that is not a realistic position because I think they were wrong about the national interest in the 30s. I think they were wrong about the net. By the way, I don't agree with them that that expanding NATO to include Poland uh, and the other countries was an unmitigated disaster the way they think. I think that's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. The fact that Russia is annoyed about it doesn't mean that it hasn't been successful. It's been tremendously successful, but they don't talk about that, you know. Mm-hmm. So I, I think that, that, that it's a little bit of a fixed game to some extist. Well, I mean, first of all, in defense of consequentialists, they sort of pick the ones they want to look at consequences about. No, I'll let them. I mean, I'm not a classic realist. I'll, I'll have to let them speak for themselves. But the um, I, I mean, I would say in defense of them, uh, there, there, of course, aren't many contemporary realists who will say we shouldn't have gotten involved in World War Two. On the other hand, of course, it's easy to say now. I mean, you know, uh, uh, who, I, I, I don't know. I don't know who was saying what back then. But um, so um, l- let me ask. But let me get back to these issues. I mean, it's a serious question, though, in, on the in the um, the interventions I listed. Some went better than others. Uh, some are thought of as having been disasters, uh, including Iraq and uh, the, the kind of the second part of the Libyan intervention when we went beyond the protection of a local population and, and went for regime change. I guess my own Why are you leaving is, out Afghanistan? Um, Don't we all, doesn't everybody think Afghanistan is one of the forever war disasters now? Uh, it hasn't. It doesn't seem to have worked out. Very well. Uh, yeah. I, and so I, yeah, add that to the list. I mean, do you think Afghanistan was a particularly neoconservative foreign policy? No, I didn't say it was. Okay. I did, I didn't list it, but, uh, you know, there was a consensus about Afghanistan. There was a I consensus mean, about Iraq too. Well, no, I was opposed to the Iraq war and I know I'm, a number I'm of glad people you were. It, it was voted 72 to 28 by the U.S. Senate and, you know. And it was opposed a, by the U.N. Security Council, but. I, but I, Oh, I'm sorry. You mean a global consensus? Is that well, what among our global? allies, among our allies. Which, which war? Which war had a global look, consensus look, behind it, Bob? Look, I agree. Well, actually, many of our interventions have involved the support of our allies, but I, I agree. <laughs> Including that, Iraq. Well, not so much. The French didn't. Well, I mean, ain't Britain, but that's France about and it. Germany didn't, and pretty much everybody else did. So you know. Well, I would just say if we had abided by international law there, we'd have been better off and, 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 and lacking Security Council uh, authorization had not done it. But leaving all that aside, look, I agree that there was near consensus within the U.S. that we should invade Iraq. I, I, it completely baffles me why that was. I'm still trying to figure it out. There was no uh, – it just does not make sense to me. I opposed it. Some other people opposed it. But my main my main question for you is looking back on all those things I listed – have you, as a matter of, uh, I mean, it gets back to the question of whether, have you evolved ideologically or do you just always thought of yourself as a realist? I mean, would you change any of the positions, not just in light of subsequent facts? In other words, not just like, well, if I had known we were going to screw up the occupation of Iraq, I don't mean like that. I mean, are, are there any in principle reconsiderations of your views on the big interventions that I listed and include Afghanistan if you want to. I mean, if you're asking, have I had a, a, a fundamental doctrinal change? The answer is no. I mean, I would like to not fight wars that turn out to be a mistake for one reason or another. Um, and I would like to not have wars that are successful, have all kinds of negative consequences, but, but nevertheless, this is the, you know, we live, we, we do history forward, not, not backward. I mean, you know, life goes forward, not backward. We don't know where things are going. Uh, we don't know what's going to succeed and what's not going to succeed. Um, I, I think the one thing that I would say is if I had known that the general public backlash to um, the various interventions, successful and unsuccessful, you know, unsuccessful and successful that took place after uh, the end of the Cold War, um, which include all kinds of things that basically worked in one way or another that you don't list. Um, 
I would have said it was you have to be careful about taxing the American people's sort of will to do this at a great, you know, it might not have been consonant with the general American attitude towards its role in the world. Now, that's a very, knowing what America's attitude towards its role in the world is a very complicated and changeable thing. But uh, certainly as, you know, in terms of the historical work that I've done, looking at American foreign policy from the beginning until, uh, you know, up, up through so far the Second World War, it's clear that uh, that the ambivalence of the American attitude toward the world is a reality and you need to be careful about it. Um, and so uh, from that point of view, I would say maybe, and certainly going forward, I think I would be more cautious just because I don't know that we can afford um, disasters uh, or at least things that are perceived as disasters because of the effect that it has on the public. Now, on the other hand, nothing ever had a bigger effect on public opinion than World War I, um, which Americans decided was a terrible catastrophe, even though it really wasn't. I mean, we were actually quite successful that the peace failed, but the war was successful, accomplished its objective. Americans went into it very enthusiastically and they, and they turned against it. And that which led to 20 years of, iso- of you know, quote unquote isolationism. So even when you do things right, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have uh, you know, you can maintain public support for the role I think the United States has to play. So I'm, I'm a, I would be a little bit more, you know, you, we do need to be cautious about that. But, you know, people want to build a doctrine around never doing Iraq again. And if you want to say, you mean we shouldn't invade a country we're not ready to based on false information have a bad acu- occupation, et cetera, I, I would agree. If you can form a doctrine around that, I'm in favor of that doctrine. But if you want to form a doctrine that that unless you're saying we should never intervene anywhere under any circumstances, you're always prone, you're, you're always putting yourself in a position where one of those interventions could go badly. And, and you know, you can't have a doctrine that prevents you from bad interventions. You can have a doctrine that prevents you from interventions, well, that would prevent that. That, w- that actually would prevent bad intervention. Right. No, you can have a doctrine that says we're never going to war, but you can't have a doctrine. If you have a doctrine that says sometimes we'll go to war, then there's no way to exclude going to war in a place like Iraq. That's that's what I would argue. If, if we're talking about doctrine mm-hmm. rather than saying what a terrible mistake that was and weren't you an idiot to support it, if we're talking about doctrine, I don't know that there is a doctrine other than pacifism that keeps you out of Iraq, out of a kind of Iraq situation. Well, you could say we won't do it when it violates international law. And if you go back and look at cases where we have and haven't violated international law with our interventions, it certainly isn't the case, as I, I would concede this, that every time it complied with international law, it worked out well. Afghanistan complied with international law. Right. But I would say that on balance, if you had only done the things that were clearly authorized under international law, uh, we'd be better off because so, because so the, you're you're basically and so at this point you would say that whether an intervention is correct or not will depend on the vote cast by Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping. I'm saying that our better rule of thumb for whether to inv- intervene than the rule we've been using, better in terms of the consequences, would be if it violates international law, don't do it. Don't say violates international law. There's only one way to have international sanction legally for an intervention, and that's to get UN Security Council Correct. permanent vote approval. Correct. And you can only get that if Putin and Xi Jinping or whoever the leaders of Russia and China are, right? So what I'm saying, therefore, is that you are going to determine what A, is in, what is legal, and B, what is appropriate, based on the judgment of Putin and Xi Jinping. Yeah, I would say that if you abided by this rule, and both Russia and China flagrantly violated it by invading uh, countries, then it would it would be time to reconsider it and lay down the law and tell them, look, you know, we'd like to do this law? thing. 
<laughs> yeah, so to mean? speak. I mean, talk to them about it. But we don't even talk about this. Nobody talks seriously about international law in the entire blob. Everybody, first of all, even in the case of Iraq, Bob, as you know, I, you know, the Bush bent over backwards to try to get the vote in the UN Security Council. I would argue he even went too far trying to get the vote because it was not clear that you needed a second vote. They had a first vote, which probably was sufficient. And it was because Tony Blair needed more domestic public support that he therefore asked Bush to go for a second vote. And by that point, the French, who would basically acquiesced in the American action, decided to oppose it for reasons which you may say are perfectly appropriate and good. But it w- my larger point, though, is that it wasn't as if Bush ig- flagrantly ignored the UN Security Council. You could argue that Clinton... More ignored it in the case of Kosovo. I which think he did. Bush, which he did. Bush made a much more sincere effort to get the vote in the Security Council, probably because of what his father had done right. uh, before than Clinton did. You know, and so. And if I go and try to get the approval of local authorities to do something, it doesn't matter how sincerely I try. If they say you can't do it, I don't do it. I mean, that's what taking law seriously means. I know, but in your, but you have the problem, Bob, that. By what you mean by taking law seriously means getting the approval of 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 Russia and China, who, for geopolitical reasons, even if they are the nicest guys in the world, for geopolitical reasons that we've been discussing, are unlikely to approve an American intervention anywhere under any circumstances. And which, and which intervention of our a recent intervention of ours, in which case would that be a disaster? Which, which thing would they have vetoed that just worked out swimmingly well? Which military intervention? Well, you, I, I would say that if they vetoed Bosnia and Kosovo, that would have been unfortunate because a lot more people would have died, and and the effects are, you know, would have been more. Would I, I, be, think, would be, I think on Kosovo, far-reaching. I think you know? on Kosovo, it's very unclear. In the case of Bosnia, I, I would say first of all, they didn't uh, veto it. We got the authorization. I would say when you're talking about actual genocide or something, as I alluded to earlier, I mean, there are cases where, given the inchoate state of international law, you are not completely, you don't have to be completely bound by international law. And I would say genocide is one of those. But, um, but still, by and large, well, a lot of people we, would argue that what was happening in Bosnia was not genocide. It might have been ethnic cleansing. That's different from genocide. Uh, yeah, well, uh, I mean, things on the borderline between ethnic cleansing and genocide, uh, so, you know, arguably would be enough for me. I mean, I haven't sat down and sketched out the rules. Um, why? But you, it, you it's, it's worth noting, by the way, that was a successful application. Nobody did veto it. We did intervene. Kosovo, um, I, I think the, 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 uh, the jury's, uh, the verdict is much more mixed. I mean, uh, Kosovo remains unsettled. It, it's, it's, um, Oh come on! Now you're Bosnia. All, the Balkans remain unsettled. You you can't right. you can't you can't say Bosnia worked and Kosovo didn't. I think they both worked, not in the sense of fixing the Balkans, but in the sense of preventing, you know, unnecessary slaughter. And, and as it happened in Europe, where you know even the Germans, in their general pacifism, uh, felt that it would have been a catastrophe to let all that happen. So if 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 you're gonna you know don't 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 put your thumb on the scales and say that the intervention that you like worked and the intervention that you didn't like didn't work just because the Balkans are unsettled. <laughs> you know? uh, but I think that I, I think there is more consensus that Bosnia was a success within the foreign policy. Um, who is it that I was, I guess it was Evo Dalder the other day, saying that nah, he didn't think uh, Kosovo had worked out uh, that well, and he was there. But, he but wrote th- a book called The Ugly War or something like right. that. Um, so, um, he, however, he was very much in favor of the Kosovo intervention. Yeah, well, then all the more credit for uh, uh, revisiting the verdict. Anyway, he doesn't oppose Bosnia. Let me ask you two uh, quick questions if you have time. One is uh, concrete. One is a little more abstract. Um, the concrete one, I mean, the broad version of it would be what would you do? What, what would you do in the Middle East? But that's maybe too broad for the amount of time we have left. If you, if you don't have time to, to make general pronouncements on what our policy should be toward the Middle East, what about Iran? Um, if you, if you became, uh, if you had the power to just re-enter the Iran nuclear deal as it existed, um, before Trump got out of it, would you do that? 
I, I don't even think that even the people who negotiated that deal think you could just slide back into it now. Now, if you ask me, should we not have pulled out of the deal? I would have said, yes, we should not have pulled out of the deal, especially absent any alternative, which I think we've demonstrated that we don't have any alternative. So, um, but whether you could get back into, I don't think the Iranians themselves would uh, you know, go back to that deal since we've demonstrated that we're completely unreliable, which is exactly what uh, Khamenei thought in the first place. And I think, you know, we've discredited anybody who ever argued that you could make a deal with the United States. So, you know, I think we are where we are, where we are with Iran. I think, you know, eventually they're going to get a nuclear weapon and we'll have to figure out how to do something about that. Um, I don't think we're in a position really to prevent them from doing it. So all we could do is slow it down, which is why I thought, you know, the deal was better than nothing. Okay, but as a, so as a thought experiment, though, if Iran said we will return to the status quo ante, so just assume assume they would. If they would return to the status quo ante, I would say that would be a beginning step that we should do. I don't think it's the end of the story. I'm 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 more concerned about the extension of Iranian sort of military involvement in the region. But at this point. With Russian involvement, Iranian involvement, Egyptian involvement, you look at you look, the Mediterranean is starting to look like a 19th century Mediterranean. Um, and, uh, you know, that is it, at least to some extent the product of, of the United States pulling, you know, significantly reducing its role, except in some very particular areas like Iran sanctions. And maybe as far as we're all concerned, that's fine. I'm sure the American people would say, yeah, let's have France and Turkey go to a war, go to war with each other over, over, uh, you know, over, you know, uh, over the Eastern Med. Um, let's let, let the Russians and the Egyptians and everybody duke it out in Libya for as long as, as they want. Um, you know, I don't think it makes the world a better place, but maybe America doesn't care. Well, I think. There are people, including me, who would argue the U.S. hasn't been a, a stabilizing force there to the extent that it has intervened. But another practical question, would you leave uh, U.S. troops in Syria? Would I leave U.S. troops in Syria? How many troops are in Syria now? Uh, enough so that uh, you could wind up having more there if you weren't careful. Uh, anyway, some. There are some. Trump keeps trying to pull them out, but he really can't fight fight the establishment. And so they're still there. Well, I, uh, honestly, at this stage with Syria, I don't, I, I have to say, I don't know. I'm not following it minutely enough to have mm-hmm. a, to have a, a judgment about that. I mean, I used to be paying more attention to Syria until we, you know, until we basically stopped having a policy there. So. Okay. Then, the, then just the, the abstract question is about democracy promotion. This was associated with neoconservatives. It's not associated with realists. There are different forms. There's kind of, you know, there's, Ranging from subsidizing, you know, groups that promote democracy in different countries or get helping giving them the tools to do it to actual regime change in the name of democracy. But in any event, the, uh, along that spectrum, there's a variety of policies that are justified, uh, by the idea that democracy promotion should be something the U.S. is up to. Is there somewhere along that spectrum you'd put yourself or what? Well, first of all, just to be clear, there never was an American intervention whose purpose was democracy promotion, and that includes Iraq. Um, there have been numerous interventions where we've gone in for other reasons, but felt that for moral and maybe sometimes even practical reasons, it was best if we could leave a democracy behind. And that's, that's a long tradition of that in the United States, um, in American foreign policy. So uh, it, 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 democracy promotion does not mean by military means. Um, whether we should in general be de- promoting democracy in the, me- in the ways that you're talking about, and mostly I would say um, because of our general influence uh, over countries that depend on us uh, for their security and economic well-being, the answer is yes. And I think that we're making a, we and the Europeans are making a, a big mistake in not uh, opposing what's happening in Hungary and not opposing what's happening in Poland more vigorously. These are countries that are entirely dependent on our security guarantee, uh, entirely dependent on their integration into the European Union, who nevertheless, are, you know, in the Hungary's case, have pretty much given up on democracy and returned to autocracy. And in Poland's case, are definitely sliding in that direction. I think that's 
we should not we should be uh, using our influence to to try to reverse that um i do think the world is better off in general if there are more democracies rather than less democracies um but i also feel like obviously any given every given situation is different and for you to just say you know for anyone to say we should we we must be doing it everywhere no matter what i think is obviously is obviously foolish but that should be uh, our default position but the one thing i've you know again history tells us that the most important thing the united states did for democracy was what it did right after world war 2 and then preserved um afterwards in terms of its uh, policies in europe and asia i think that was the and it was mostly about security and economics um but the consequence was democracy um So I mean so yes that's what we should be doing uh, you know in so far as we can. But does it mean that you know I I'm very skeptical of our capacity to do anything to promote democracy in China for instance it doesn't mean that we shouldn't um criticize them um and in some cases as you say if it, if they undertake really you know a particularly egregious activity like what they're doing uh to the Uyghurs that that we should even uh sanction them in some way. I'm more interested in sanctioning them on that than on trade which we seem to be perfectly delighted to do. Um uh, uh so uh, so I think I think that, at this point Trump has sanctioned them for almost everything the well, I mean across true. the board. That's true. Um okay. So and I guess the, the, that kind of gets at what you mean by the liberal part of the liberal realist uh, right the, the 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 there is an element of, of of supporting liberal democracy both in terms of what nations you most closely associate with and and how you try to use your kind of soft power well, let me just let me just end on this note because i think we've uh, probably driven whatever audience there was away at this by this point but don't underestimate our audience okay um the thing i want to emphasize about what i'm calling liberal realism is just the understanding that liberalism is not the end point of human existence it's not where we're inevitably heading um it is it is the product of a particular world system that is undergirded by power and influence and other mm-hmm. things and therefore um you know we can't just be waiting for liberalism to sprout everywhere naturally because it isn't going to in fact look liberalism is under siege now here in the united states i mean we have lit- you know demonstrable anti-liberal forces at work in the united states and obviously uh in europe as well and so um we have to recognize that it is a struggle so in that sense i am not a realist i'm a realist in the sense of saying that for liberalism to succeed it needs to have power behind it okay all right that is the last word I have not I have not given up on my project of uh enlightening you but I will leave that project where it stands which I think is roughly where it started It, it takes a long time Bob it takes a long time Okay I'm I'm not giving up on you Thanks so much Bob I appreciate it uh and maybe we'll do this again uh down the road Look forward to it thanks Bob